Hello and welcome to this Serial Geek TV episode commentary for Into Etheria, an episode of She-Ra, Princes of Power, produced by Formation Studios. So, here we are with the very first episode of She-Ra. Even to this day, people seem to be confused by the order of things. Thus, I'll start off by summarising the production. The first five episodes of She-Ra were produced as Into Etheria, Beast Island, She-Ra Unchained, Reunions, and Battle for Bright Moon, collectively known as The Sword of She-Ra, parts 1 to 5. After production was completed, Filmation decided to edit together the first five episodes of She-Ra, trimming the content for time, and releasing it as a movie in theatres titled The Secret of the Sword, to better showcase the introduction of She-Ra, and capitalise on the huge success of Masters of the Universe. As a kid, I actually saw the movie version in the cinema, as the first five episodes never aired on terrestrial TV in the UK. My mother took me to see the movie in a cinema in Waltham Cross in London that, last time I checked, is now a bingo hall. How the mighty have fallen. Anyway, I remember being utterly amazed watching He-Man and She-Ra on the big screen. My mother still remembers the experience fondly, saying that she really enjoyed it, especially the music, so props to Shooky Levy. So here we go with Into Etheria, penned by the late, great Larry Dottilio. Larry once stated to me that he wished Filmation had asked him to write a specific He-Man and She-Ra movie, as he rightly stated that combining five individual episodes of a TV show does not quite make a movie, specifically highlighting that he felt the film tonally shifts between his scripts and Bob Ford's, not in a negative way, as Bob Ford was one of the best writers to have ever worked on He-Man and She-Ra. The sorceress's dream nightmare that we have seen is one of the Guardian of Castle Greyskull's most important scenes ever, as she recalls Hordak's kidnapping of Adora. Of course, to new viewers, the scene makes little sense, as we recognise neither Hordak nor the baby. All we know is that there is an intense feeling of horror, as symbolised perfectly in the image of the laughing face of Hordak overlapping the struggling body of the sorceress. Such a great image. Rarely would these two cornerstone characters ever be connected, but in this scene, Hordak's legacy on Eternia is profound and evident right from the very beginning. And when you think about it, in many ways, Hordak's kidnapping of Adora is the greatest evil act ever committed by a villain in either the He-Man or She-Ra series. Can it be? After so long... Skeletor never does anything as devastating and as cruel as to steal a child from their parents and raise her for nearly two decades. That's pretty evil, right? There is an atmospheric sense throughout these opening scenes that says to us something big is about to happen. This will be no ordinary mission or quest. And when you think about it, never before has the need for a journey come from within Castle Greyskull itself. This is one of the most important elements of the sequence that Castle Greyskull itself is calling for a quest. Destiny is the only thing that is making this happen. We already get the sense that the Ancients have planned this out. They were expecting Adora to be raised on Etheria and have determined that this very day would be the one to change the future for all time. And boy does it. And so the sorceress realises the pull of fate and with Adam here she tells him virtually nothing knowing that destiny will take care of itself. The sorceress actually expresses her own desire to enter the portal but she reminds Adam that she is powerless outside the castle. It's funny in this scene Prince Adam finds himself with a sword that has no explanation, a mission with no goal and a dimensional gate that leads to a place he does not know. This must be his most frustrating venture ever but it is also his most important. Adam, please, ask no questions. Until you find this one, I can say nothing. The very fate of the universe may depend on your success. I do love the visuals throughout this scene with the sorcerers Adam and Cringer stood in front of the dimensional gate. The lighting really sets the dramatic tone. As I said before, this is no ordinary quest. And it's kind of ironic that Prince Adam begins the episode by mixing the batter for his famous spice bread. When you think about it, Prince Adam making his famous spice bread is the series' last opportunity to show Adam before he has knowledge of his sister and to show how much his life will change. Perhaps one final teasing scene between him and Teela would have been appropriate. It would have shown Adam's last time with the only sister he has ever known before venturing forth to find his true sibling. And here we are on Etheria. 
The world into which Prince Adam steps is similar to Eternia's but extremely different at the same time. This is an example of the true craftsmanship of Filmation Studios. Their background artists were some of the most visually inspired people of the 1980s, crafting unique looking worlds, drawing from numerous inspirations to create these wonderfully beautiful and terrifying worlds of Eternia and Etheria. Rather than the brown and green fertile plains and the twisted trees of the evergreen forest, Adam quickly sees the edge of the whispering woods, an area of low-lying brush filled with puffy pink spheres, blue and yellow stalks and lush green vegetation. The pastel colours are prominent throughout, already indicating to us that this planet is a more feminine and magical world than Eternia. I do love the laughing swan, and maybe that's because I like alcohol. Regardless, we can see the animators have made some effort to draw the peasant Etherians differently than Eternians. This inn reminds me of the original DC Masters of the Universe comics. In those stories we saw taverns much like the Laughing Swan Inn, but thinking about it I can't think of too many times, nay any times, that we saw a tavern in the Filmation He-Man cartoon. This does feel like a first. And it's a shame because I think a writer or an artist can do some rather lovely world building by including an inn or two, littering it with a bunch of locals. And now, let's talk about the Horde Troopers because there's something very interesting about them in the first five episodes and some of the earliest episodes of the series. They were not robots. Before they were designed to all look the same, it was scripted that the three Horde Troopers in the Laughing Swan Inn were going to have their respective faces visible. Marg, whose name we hear, was the scar-faced hordesman, and he was to be accompanied by a reptilian hordesman, which explains why one of the horde troopers speaks with a hiss, and a hawk hordesman. Oh, so the harp player, something interesting about that character I should bring up before his harp is destroyed. The She-Ra series had a great deal of development work put into it with both Mattel and Filmation creating the characters with designs going back and forth. Well, one character written and designed for the show was Willowind. Willowind is described as a handsome beanpole of a man who is a travelling entertainer. He sings, he tells stories, he works stage magic, well, sleight of hand. His love of freedom prompted him to join the rebellion and his personality does much to lighten the load. In battle he is reckless and cunning and he and Bo are good comrades. What happened to Willowind I hear you ask? Willowind is the harp player we see here in the Laughing Swan Inn. However, as the cast was developed, the decision to remove Willowind was made, and his singing, storytelling, and stage magic were all simply given to Bo. In the script, the harp player is just referred to as a bard. However, yes, he was originally going to be a recurring key member of the cast. <laughs> hey, good thing Tila taught me that move. What I love more than anything about this confrontation between Prince Adam and the Horde Troopers is that it highlights something that I've always liked to call Adam the Ethereum. As we see here, on Etheria, with no family or tealer in sight, he can shed his fun-loving, irresponsible image and act as he would do in certain situations, situations on Eternia that he would run away from in order to transform into He-Man. What we see on Etheria is a much more confident, self-assured man who is not afraid to stand up and fight. He immediately challenges the Horde Troopers without any thought of transforming into He-Man first. Think about that for a second. This is a very important point because it shows us that Prince Adam does not need He-Man all of the time. Aside from the fear the Horde Troopers instill in the villagers, this scene is of course notable for the first appearance of the cloaked bow and cow. It's interesting that these two rebels will be the first for us to meet. In many ways, Bo and Cal compare easily with Adam and Cringer. Bo and Adam are both headstrong male leaders that fight unapologetically against the forces of evil. Two characters that parallel even more closely are their companions Cringer and Cal. Whilst Cal has the upper hand in the intelligence arena, both he and Cringer are complete cowards that rely on their human caretakers to protect them. I love the visual of Adam and Bo shaking hands as it feels like a momentous moment in the series. Eternia and Etheria meet. A deleted scene in the script had Prince Adam and Bo add further insult to injury by throwing cream pies in the faces of the Hordesmen. From now on my friend, you are part of the Great Rebellion. And Act 1 draws to a close. 
Bo and Cal's participation in this episode is limited to their recruitment of Adam, as the villains seem to overwhelm the story in Act 2, as you will see. And now, here we are at the Fright Zone, an entire new cast for us to feast our eyes over. Have no fear though, many of them will thankfully be name checked. Larry Dottilio knew how to pen an introductory scene for new characters. Notice how vast they attempt to make the Fright Zone in these shots, especially when we see a fleet of ships fly past Hordak's throne in the background. This implies that the Fright Zone is utterly huge inside. Sadly, many episodes of the series do not exploit the vastness of it. The ruthless leader of the evil Horde, Hordak, is immediately presented as the image of a cool, collected and evil dictator. A quick comparison between he and Skeletor instantly reveals their differing treatments of their allies. While Skeletor sits at a table with his lackeys, Hordak stands over them on an elevated throne. We get the sense that this is a domineering, controlling villain, powerful enough that his allies never question him or even think of overthrowing him. The ships I mentioned before that fly past in the background remind us of the planet ruling army of the Horde, a complex organisation all under the ironclad fist of Hordak, and as we later find out, Horde Prime. I have a plan which will bring this stranger into the open. George Dicenzo provides the villain with a deep, rich voice that only supports Hordak's evilness. Originally, Hordak was supposed to be the antithesis of Skeletor, a perfectly cruel villain with no hint of humour or comedic potential. Unfortunately, Hordak would lose this lofty image as the series progressed like many a Saturday morning villain before and after him. At least we can treasure the perfected Hordak in this episode, a sterling presence for the forces of good to overcome. And now we're about to meet the Great Rebellion. Well, the Rebellion and only a few of them really. The most important function of any premiere episode is to establish the major characters and their personalities. Larry Dottilio focuses on the major rebels and begins to form their unique characteristics in these forthcoming scenes. Though it's amusing to think that we meet Sprague before so many of the other rebels in this series. Although not used a great deal in the show, Sprague's appearances were thankfully often quite memorable. See the season 1 episode Troll's Dream. Cringer will shortly remark that the rebel camp is very small, and while that may be true, it only makes the rebels seem that much closer. One of my issues with the She-Ra show is that as the series progressed, the rebel camp did not feel like a rebel camp, just a place they lived. There didn't really seem to be a desire to win back Etheria in most episodes, but that's always the problem with a lack of episodic storytelling. Because Filmation were happy for the episodes to be shown out of order, the idea that the Rebels could slowly win back the planet was never really going to fly because showing the episodes out of order with a lack of continuity would lead to much confusion on the part of the viewer. When Prince Adam is introduced to Glimmer, she is startled by the handsome visitor and hints slightly a romantic interest in him. This little morsel of infatuation would not be explored until more than a year later in the season 2 episode Just The Way You Are. In this first scene, Glimmer immediately appears as a young, organised leader. We sense that she is a leader less out of desire but more out of a lack of a more qualified one, which we will find out is very much the case. Clearly the rebellion is young. Glimmer's early level-headedness seems to fade away in future episodes as the writers incorrectly choose to script her as childish and foolish instead. Three it is! Oh dearie my! Oh, we must work on these landings! And now we have the arrival of Madame Raz, whom enters the scene abruptly crashing into some trees with Broom. Their relationship is virtually cemented with this first scene as the scatterbrained Madam fails to remember the important thing she has to tell Glimmer, with Broom having to remind her. This is just a taste of the humour that would become the mainstay of the Rebels' relationships. Although the Twiggit Sprague pops in and out of the episode, his role is rather limited and always would be. In fact, as depicted in Into Etheria, the Rebels seem pretty much solidified as characters. Bo would always be a show-off arrow shooter, Glimmer a gentle magical leader, Cowl a know-it-all coward, Sprague an enthusiastic and eager twigget, Madame Raz a source of comedic relief, and Broom would always be a loyal sidekick with a wonderful voice from Lou Scheimer. And that's exactly where the problem with the She-Ra cast lies. None of the Rebel characters evolve or change. A premiere episode is always the perfect time to plant seeds of personality, traits for the regular characters, and Larry Dottilio has done that successfully here. 
But these seeds are reused so often in the series that they are the characters. One could watch this episode and one of the last she episodes side by side and observe virtually no change in the rebel characters. But when we watch He-Man's premiere episode, Diamond Ray of Disappearance, we marvel at how much the characters have evolved over the course of the series. For example, Tila is only the captain of the Royal Guard in the premiere. Later we would learn that she is a motherless but adopted child with her destiny lying within the walls of Castle Greyskull. And Orko in the very same episode is nothing but a demented court jester. The tales of Troller and Orko the Great are yet to come. We can see these early depictions and realise how much the characters have evolved since. Certainly the seeds planted in Diamond Rev Disappearance are important, but they have become only small parts of their respective characters. This contrasts sharply with Into Etheria, in which the early seeds become the entire characters, with no real further exploration or development, and it's a crying shame. It's interesting that Adam is contemplating transforming into his alter ego. He clearly realises that he can only accomplish so much in their mission to free the village of Thamor. Catra and her colleagues appear extremely bored and disillusioned in this scene. <laughs> Mantena even appears with heavy eyelids. He suggests they burn the village but Scorpio refers to a colleague that would never let them do it. Just as Leech bemoans the individual in question, a new character, a striking, statuesque blonde woman, Adora, shows up. I wonder what her story is. You four better be on your guard. These rebels seem bolder than most. Adora went through many, many designs, and I'm sure I'll talk about them at some point on this channel, but her final design, as seen in the series, was the work of Diane Keener. It's a shame that the model department gave her the exact same costume she would wear in the remainder of the series. Actually, in the UK Princess of Power comic, Adora is depicted in a blue Horde Force Captain uniform complete with Horde insignia. It's a far better appearance as, much like her allies, it shows that she is part of something bigger. We see that already there is severe resentment between the Horde members and the hierarchy. This group of villains is ready to commit mutiny, proving that Adora is already very different from the rest. Writer Larry Dottilio's choice of villains for this scene is interesting as he focuses on three entities that would be turned into action figures, Catra, Leech and Mantena, and one creation that sadly never became a toy, Scorpia, leaving the henchman Grizzlaw for a later introduction. I love how Catra's power is showcased. Actually, all of the Horde Warriors have their powers showcased in this action scene, with Leech being one of the most impressive. He seems to be the most powerful and outspoken of the group, draining Glimmer's energy and criticising Adora. His ugly appearance make him the most wretched of Horde Warriors. Though surprisingly, Leech's role in the series only diminishes from here. He is very much the Triclops of this show, a prominent, memorable action figure, but a character forgotten by the animated series. By the power of Ray Skull. As I mentioned, I saw the movie version The Secret of the Sword at the cinema and I still remember sitting in my seat and looking up at the screen as the transformation sequence took place. It was amazing. The audience loudly cheered. It was utterly fantastic. For the movie version, numerous musical cues were rewritten for the movie to make them more grand, and it really works when you compare the two. Well, that takes care of the rebels. You haven't won yet. I suggest you let my friends go. It's great to see an entire group of heroes and villains shocked at the sudden appearance of He-Man and Battle Cat. That's the beauty of this initial crossover. There are so many firsts for all the characters involved. <laughs> can, you, can you imagine being the Horde and seeing something unique, like a muscle-bound barbarian wielding a sword mounted on a giant green and yellow striped tiger? You'd be somewhat taken back, right? So, as I said, the Horde have their powers showcased in this battle. The Horde member that is arguably the most memorable is Scorpia with her unique appearance and hilarious scene with He-Man. It is strange that Scorpia is the most memorable villain of the group since she has no true powers and her future appearances in the series would be sparse at best. Not as sparse as Leech, but sparse nonetheless. The interesting thing is that because this is still so early on, He-Man and Battle Cat's defeat of the villains doesn't really undermine them. Perhaps more of a shock for the regular She reviewers is the depiction of Mantena who has not yet developed into his role as a bumbling villain and comic relief. In fact, he seems rather abject and serious and he even succeeds in stopping the villagers and reducing He-Man to his knees. Who'd have thunk it? 
Mantena's first battle actually makes him seem like a formidable villain, but those trapdoor scenes are just around the corner. And I adore Sprague helping out He-Man. Larry Dottilio sensibly still grounds He-Man, making him fallible in certain situations. And the most powerful man in the universe does need help from time to time, even from the smallest of beings. That's a deal. And now we have the confrontation between He-Man and Adora. Although Adora attempts some semblance of evil, we all too quickly sense that she is anything but. And I mean, it doesn't help that her design presents her, unlike her allies, as very heroic looking. As I say, a change in uniform with that striking horde emblem would have gone a long way into making this version of Adora seem a little more unique. It's so interesting to see He-Man wielding the Sword of Protection. Bizarrely, at the very start of the second part, Beast Island, when we are shown this scene in the recap at the beginning of the episode, He-Man is holding the Sword of Power and Adora is holding the Sword of Protection as they square off. Very odd. What is interesting about this scene is the way Adora is played, barely able to engage with He-Man in a sword fight and telling him to stay away. It's strongly implied that she has risen the ranks solely because she is favoured by the hierarchy and is constantly protected by Horde officials, and maybe that's the feeling we are supposed to have. One of the most important elements of this episode ending battle is the fact that the Horde defeats the Rebellion outright. It's not as dramatic as the fantastic season 1 episode The Price of Freedom in which the Horde burn a village, defeat He-Man and She-Ra and then simply leave, but still. And thus concludes the first episode of She-Ra, Princess of Power. With drama, mystery, heart and humour, this episode has every element needed to capture audiences of yesteryear or today. The late great Larry Dottilio weaves the story expertly and introduces us to the world he has created with a care for his work like no other. It introduces us to compelling new characters who are crafted realistically and with diligence. Into Etheria is an epic, dramatic first chapter to the Sword of She-Ra. Let's just say She-Ra, Princess of Power, was off to a very good start. And that's the end of this commentary. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, like, share and subscribe and I'll catch you on the next one.